Hello and welcome to Defund the BBC. I'm Ted Jeffrey, and joining me this week is a journalist who for many years worked at the BBC, uh, but after leaving the corporation decided to write a book titled Can We Trust the BBC, in which he alleged there was a pervasive and institutional wing bias at the broadcaster. I am, of course, talking about Robin Aitken. Robin, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. So just to kick off, this week, uh, Tim Davey had originally promised in front of a select committee to crack down on taxpayer-funded stars mouthing off their political opinions on Twitter. However, it appears as though Mr. Davey has only disciplined two BBC staffers. Meanwhile, stars like Gary Lineker continue to remain overtly political on issues ranging from migration to climate change and even calling the Prime Minister a liar. Robin, first of all, what do you make of this? Um, well, I think Tim Davies got a long way to go before he delivers on that promise. Um, I can see the difficulty with someone like uh, Lineker, because Lineker, of course, is not BBC staff. He's a BBC star, but he's, a, but he's not staff. Um, so I'm not sure of the, the legal position on that, but I would think that um, the, it's easier for the BBC to say to someone who's a staff member, a staff journalist, you can't do that. And as far as I know, there has been a bit of a crackdown on, on staff people. With someone like Lineker, something is always worth remembering actually about stars is that very often these people, it's not just in the BBC, but it's elsewhere also, you know, they become bigger than the, in a sense, you know, they become bigger than the organization they work for. Um, and it's difficult for um, the, the, the organization to discipline the star but I think that the, um, that, that I would say Lineker was on thin ice because um, I think that Tim Davey has made these commitments publicly and he can be held to them. And if this continues, then, you know, his credentials will be called into doubt. And, you know, there are plenty of MPs, plenty of politicians who are interested in this subject. BBC is desperate to get some sort of um, settlement with the government uh, to get back on the right track with the government. So what I'm saying is, I think it's disappointing that Lineker uses his platform in the way that he does. I'm not sure just uh, what levers the BBC has to discipline him. That's the problem. Well, the BBC uh, clearly has a lot of guilt for uh, classic comedy shows, as we've seen. Um, you know, a lot of classic comedy shows they broadcast, things like Faulty Towers, Hello, Hello. Uh, they're constantly slapping content warnings on them. <laughs> now, <laughs> Robin, would you agree that the corporation is now sort of totally out of touch and is also at the mercy of woke millennials that are offended by everything? It it's completely pathetic, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It's 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 risible, and it's it's uh, the you know once you yeah once you start going down this line, it's like a sort of Stalinist. Uh, it, it's like trying to erase from history, you know, people who have sinned in the past, and it's applying. Um, it's applying these new woke standards to a different era. And I think it just, I think it just makes the BBC look ridiculous. And, um, you know, the, you have to wonder just what lies at the bottom of this. So if you're a BBC manager and you're saying to yourself that something which appeared first of all, 30 years ago in one of these comedy shows, you know, Faulty Towers or something. Um, so it was okay then. Uh, times have moved on. Uh, we now cannot broadcast this because of the risk of offending somebody. But if you make this question of offence the hurdle which must be crossed, 
you know, what happens to your comedy content? You know, who are you allowed? After all, comedy, you know, by its nature, um, someone has to be a butt of the joke, don't they? You know, without the butt, no joke. <laughs> so if, you, <laughs> if no one can be the butt, you know, no jokes. And it's a sort of, I mean, just absurd and I, I think I think you know it's the kind of thing that enrages people and it just enrages people if I was a BBC manager I would you know I don't know where are these complaints coming from who is it that's complaining about these things I mean who knows you know why what standards are being applied it's also anachronistic you know they're applying they're applying 21 21 2021 attitudes and, and and rules to something which happened 30 40 years ago it just doesn't work yeah you're absolutely right and it will be interesting to get your sort of next uh, your take on this next topic because you spent time uh, at the bbc working there and uh, bbc news seemed to be presenting as as fact that 48 percent of trans youth attempt suicide and this was this statistic i should say was based on a sample of just 27 people mm. now surely the bbc should know better than to peddle this dangerous trans suicide myth pushing anti-science ideology i think the bbc has a lot of questions to answer over the, the trans issue you know my um my sense about the trans issue is that an awful lot of people who now are considering themselves trans have psychological issues. So I think that a lot of these people are very unhappy. The BBC is at fault, I believe, for having um, put so much emphasis on this trans issue. Let me give you an example. I have um, someone in my family circle who is a teenage boy and he goes to school in North London. And I jokingly asked him um, some months ago, I said, uh, you know, if you, if you come out, he's only about 14 or so. So I was making a bit of a joke of it. And I said, you know, any of this trans stuff going on in your school? He said there were five five children in his class of 30 who were considering themselves to be transgender. Now, how do you explain a rash of circumstance like that? It has to be because there is a fashion now amongst children for considering themselves trans. Who is to blame for this? I think that the people to blame for this are those people who have been campaigning and promoting this trans agenda. And the BBC is at fault, in my view, for giving them so much airtime. They have, I mean, they are obsessed with this trans issue. And, you know, children of that age are very suggestible. You know, I mean, it's a long time since I was a teenager, obviously. Um, I can just about remember it. And I can remember what a troubling time it was you know, for all sorts of reasons. It's just, that's just life, you know. I mean, you know, it's a troubled time because you don't know much about sex. You don't know much about life. I didn't know anything about girls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most of us are in that position at some point or other in our pubertal period. To introduce this idea that somehow your sex is an optional thing, that you can be male or female, turns reality on its head. And it's a wicked, wicked thing to do to children. I think it amounts to child abuse. My complaint against the BBC is that they have, they have been far too gullible and far too ready to promote these dangerous, wicked, and sinister arguments about gender. And um, I hold the BBC responsible for that in part because hook, line and sinker, they've, they've just swallowed the propaganda of the trans activists. Shame on them. Now, uh, you know, sort of bringing it back to 
BBC journalists in particular, do you, do you find as well that there, there tends to be a particular sort of lazy streak amongst some BBC journalists, essentially trying to make a story out of anything? Uh, one instance of this happening is when BBC News decided to post a national story about getting more black women into cycling. You know, don't you think it's quite worrying that our public service broadcaster has to resort to race baiting in order to create a story? Um, well, I do take the point about race baiting. You know, you know, um, the, the BBC's coverage, in my view, is now racialist. It's obsessed with race. And of course, that plays exactly into the hands of those people who want to use race in a political way. Um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement um, presents itself as a cuddly human rights issue. Now, we can all agree, can't we, that there is no place for um, racism. There is no uh, justification for discrimination against people of color or any other attribute for that matter, that we all deserve in a democracy to be treated fairly and equally. But there are plenty of people on the left, particularly the revolutionary left, who want to use um, the idea of racial inequality to disturb the politics of the country, to, um, to create amongst minority groups the sense that they are victims. And Black Lives Matter, far from being a cuddly, uh, non-aligned movement, was started by Marxists and is actually a revolutionary organization. That is my complaint against uh, the BBC in this matter. I mean, they're always ready to look for this racial ang angle. And that plays exactly into the hands of those who wish to pretend that this country is a seething bed of injustice, which it is not. You know, so many surveys have shown that British people, uh, you know, we can, you know, we're not perfect. We could do better. But when you compare us to almost every other country, we do better in this regard. We are more welcoming, more tolerant. And you know, that is true, certainly of most of our European neighbors. We do far better than most of them in terms of this. And yet the BBC seems hell bent on promoting the idea that you know, this place is a, is a hell hole of racial, racial injustice. It's absurd. Now, now you, you recently wrote a piece in The Telegraph uh, where you highlighted how, according to the BBC's annual report and accounts, more than 185 BBC executives earn £150,000 a year or more. Now, that's 185 employees at the BBC who earn just as much or more than the Prime Minister. Is it any surprise that pensioners are refusing to fork out for these out-of-touch elites? And it's no surprise at all. Um, I mean, look, some of the jobs of the top executives at the BBC are undoubtedly very exacting and demanding. Um, the man I worked for when he, he was editor of the Today program, Rod Little, a man I have a great deal of time for. And he worked bloody hard really hard. I mean, that's one of those jobs that's kind of 24-7, you know, it's a terrible job. But <laughs> he was never paid that kind of money. He was paid on an editor's rank, which, I mean, he was pulling in a decent screw, I dare say, but nothing like that sort of figure you're talking about. Those sorts of figures are reserved for these people who are in this endless hierarchy of executives, you know, um, the rot set in, you know, with this, um, and it reached uh, a peak of absurdity. And actually, in my view, it was a scandalous thing. But under the uh, leadership of um, Mark Thompson back in the 2000s, in the noughties, 
I think he left in 2008, 2009, this time he left. Now, Thompson uh, ended up paying himself £800,000 a year as director general. And that, to me, was larcenous. I mean, I, think, I thought that was really scandalous. And, and it caused a lot of bitterness in the BBC. You know, I was a BBC reporter, and I never complained about my salary. But I don't think if I told you what my salary was, you wouldn't be dropping, you know, your mouth would not be dropping open. It was, <laughs> you know, it was a decent salary, but it was, you know, I'm not a rich man as a result of it. Nor did I expect to be, nor did most of my colleagues expect to get rich. What we expected was a decent rate for the job. But the BBC has now a layer of fat in its executive levels, which is actually a disgrace. And of course, that plays into the reluctance of people to pay their license fee. You know, when you think how many license fees it takes to pay, for instance, the lady who goes by under the title of the Divert Diversity Tsar, you know, she's paid 17, the equivalent of 1,700 pounds a day. I mean, that is ridiculous. That is just ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and finally, Robin, you know, don't you find it, and it again ties into all the things we've been talking about today, don't you find it just astonishing that in this day and age, where channels like GB News are proving to be very popular and news is available from so many different sources, that if Britons don't want to watch the BBC anymore, but like watching live sport, for example, they still have to fund a corporation that treats them so badly. Well, I think that the, the, the argument that you're raising is about, you know, the, the, the license fee and whether, it, I mean, you're quite right, of course, that, um, the license fee, it looks to me as if it's running out of road. And it's running out of road for a number of different reasons. There are people who feel the BBC doesn't represent them and they don't like what it produces, so they don't see why they should have to pay. That's one group. But there's another group, and a growing group, of younger people who get their news and information and entertainment from all sorts of sources on the internet. Um, and for those people, the idea that you have to pay a state broadcaster this annual levy seems just antiquated, a, a sort of throwback to an era they don't recognize. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem the BBC has. And I, I, I do wonder, you know, the, we've, got the, um, we've got the review of the midterm review of the charters of the BBC run 10 years at a time. Um, the last one was signed into law in 2017, so next year is the midway point. So there's a review at that. Now I'm, I'm waiting to see what comes out of that midterm review because there have been heavy hints dropped by various government ministers that um, you know, maybe it's time to tell the BBC that the license fee um, is no longer fit for purpose. I wouldn't be at all surprised were that to happen next year. And, you know, they would be then put on notice that maybe in 2027, that's it for the license fee or something like that. They'll fight tooth and nail, of course, to preserve it because um, it's such a valuable privilege and it allows the BBC still to dominate the British broadcasting and media scene because, you know, this is a guarantee of income and it's a privilege which none of the other broadcasters um, are in receipt of. And the BBC, in my view at the moment, is abusing it. Well, Robin, thank you so much for joining us today at DEEF on the BBC. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.